I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. My partner, Kristen Oaks-White, is on assignment this week. What a difference a year makes. This time last year, Louisiana sugarcane farmers were slogging through some wet, sloppy conditions when they began to harvest. This year, the dry weather we've had has been very helpful. As Twyla's Neil Melanson shows us, what they're seeing so far is even sweeter this year. It's a common sight on the road these days. Trucks hauling sugarcane are all across South Louisiana right now. These trucks are going to the Cora Texas Sugar Mill in Plaquemines, which has a cooperative agreement among nearly 50 producers to serve 50,000 acres in the area. It's an agreement that benefits both the growers and the mill, according to Cora Texas COO Charlie Shudmack. By having it all in a group, we're able to move trucks around if one breaks in some place. Uh, we, we'll, we can coordinate all that a lot better than having each farm have its individual, individual trucks. The trucks here are not only driving, they're doing a lot of waiting. The mill's three bays are working to capacity to bring the sugar in where it gets dumped into the warehouse. One reason all the sugar is piling up is because of the weather. Shudmak says, like most of us, he hopes it cools down soon, but as long as it's dry, it's good for the harvest. Yeah, we had a very wet season last year, so it's great to start in the dry weather. Uh, we don't have to deal with all the mud that we had to deal with last year. The cane's a lot, lot sweeter, a lot more sugar. Uh, could use some cool weather, but we'd rather it hot and dry than cold and wet. One of the growers delivering to Cora, Texas is Patrick Frischhertz. He says the crop is about 10% less in tonnage this year, but about 10% sweeter, which means it's about an average crop. One thing he's seeing is damage from late season rains last year that are hampering this year's crop. Due to the, to the wet harvest of last year and then the, the wet spring this year, we had trouble cultivating, basically fixing the mess that we made last year. And that's causing some slight yield reduction this year, but. Because we've had good weather this summer and this fall, I'm expecting and hoping for an average to slightly above average crop maybe. Fershert says despite all the challenges, he loves this sugarcane harvest. One interesting thing is that before he was a farmer, he was a lawyer with no ag background. But every day he's out here, he says, is another day in paradise. Well, I love farming because you're working with people, you're working with the land. I, 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 I joked with family and I say it's a clean living and that every day I go home and I feel good about what we've done. We've been able to accomplish something and uh, it's overall it's just very enjoyable working with people. Sugarcane harvest normally runs through December and last year it was the middle of January before it wrapped up for most folks. Good weather like this can significantly bump up the timeline, but there's still a lot left in the season. And of course, Avery, you know, who knows what that weather will bring. That's just a long time. It's unprecedented for almost every single crop, you know. The Florida guys, of course, as we've talked about, have a mm -hmm. longer one, but it's still sugarcane. But man, I mean, that's just a long time to let your crop sit out in, their, in the field and wonder, you know, how it's going to mm -hmm. be. How much cold weather we're going to get, how much rain. But I was watching something on 60 Minutes where they talked about the biggest issue this year overall with uh, farming is weather. Right. And so, I mean, when you look across the country, at least this is some good news for a change. It is, and sugarcane is one of the few success stories we're seeing in farming right now. Not only price is pretty good, but uh, for everything, as you heard in that story, mm -hmm. it's about 10% more sugar this year than last. Well, let's hope that shows for sweet rewards next year as well. Thank you, Neil Malasso. Some top fashion designers from all over the world made a visit to Concordia Parish recently. It was part of the Farm to Fashion Tour. As Twyla's Tammy Arinder tells us, some of these folks working in the clothing industry had never seen a cotton field. You may not give a lot of thought to where your next pair of jeans will come from, but these people do. This group is made up of top clothing designers from all over the world. 40 plus brands, the top senior VP level, the top designers, the people making the decisions, and never has that ever happened for people to come together for three days. So BASF's E3 cotton team brought these fashion execs to the new Vidalia Mills textile plant in Concordia Parish. Of locally sourced cotton, uh, one of the most environmentally uh, uh, up-to-date mills in the world, really redefining how you can make denim and how it could have a minimal impact. That minimal impact refers to sustainability and efficiency. 
That's where BASF's E3 cotton comes in. Environmentally friendly, it is economically viable, it's socially equitable. We're passionate about American cotton. We're, we're passionate about BASF's E3 program, which gets complete transparency and accountability through the supply chain. And we think that that adds a real value um, uh, against other sort of competing sustainability uh, protocols. Most of these fashion folks have never stepped foot on a farm. So they were taken to a cotton field in neighboring Tinsaw Parish. For clothing entrepreneur Matt Edmondson with the Imogene and Willie brand out of Nashville, it was an eye-opening experience. To see everything firsthand really puts it all in perspective. We are always looking for ways to improve upon the old ways. And knowing that now a state-of-the-art facility that literally its only purpose in, in uh, creating it is to look at the sustainability component. You know, when we think about sustainability, we don't think about just one piece of the process, whether it's just the meal or maybe just the farmer, you know, planting. We think about the whole process and the whole thing of it. Besides the sustainability aspect, this new mill will also bring some 600 jobs to the Vidalia area. I'm Tammy Arinder in Vidalia for this week in Louisiana Agriculture. Vidalia Mills will start spinning yarn in November and should be fully operational by spring of next year. October 4th was Ag Day in St. James Parish and there was no better place to celebrate than the fast food farm. Second and third graders from all across South Louisiana made their way to the farm with 30 hands-on exhibits on how crops are grown, animals are raised, and most importantly, where their food and fiber come from. Ken Gidry, who helped start the fast food farm, retired as the St. James Parish 4-H agent. He's still coming back to help as he's seen the positive impact the farm has on children. I get to see the kids here at the farm and then when I go, when go to the schools, uh, the 4-H'ers would talk about them and then when you see the younger kids, they're like, I know you, you're the guy from the farm. And then if you ask them questions, a lot of times they can tell you some of the things they've done and, and seen at the farm, which means that we're making an impact on what the kids. The fast food farm is on the property of sugarcane growers Scrap and Denise Email, who are active in youth events, particularly through Farm Bureau. All second and third grade students in the parish were invited, as well as children from other parishes. Speaking of 4-H, this year's 4-H week theme is inspiring kids to do. And that's exactly what's happening this week all across Louisiana. In Baker, East Baton Rouge Parish 4-H agents spent the day at an area school to teach junior high students how to fly a drone, hands-on experience. That's a skill that could have many uses in agriculture as more and more technology makes its way to the farm. We have a great partnership with 4-H and um, Jesse Hayden and Rochelle uh, Wilkins works in East Baton Rouge Parish and so Jesse already had a program at Impact and so for this year we just partnered with 4-H to supply really the drone content for Jesse's 4-H uh, program. Technology is playing like a very large part in agriculture. You mentioned that people are driving tractors like with technology. They have a lot of tractors that drive themselves now, so I'm pretty sure they have some drones that drive themselves too, and hopefully our kids can learn something about that, get into the field in the future. We can send them in the field in the future, that'll be, that'll be like an accomplishment for EBR 4-H. So this morning we started by asking them three or four questions from last month. It was very interesting to see what they remembered. And then each one of them today will actually learn to fly a drone. One of the best experiences I've had for one of these programs. Uh, I like how they can actually put their hands on something that's more modern. Our goal for today is for every student to be successful flying a drone. So we'll build on that. You know, some will like it, some won't, some will take to it better, but there's really a, you know, a place for everybody, whether it's the filming industry or public relations or the technology part. One thing that we're particularly interested in and that we specialize in is the imagery that the drones collect and being able to offload that into a GIS system and so that's drones to smart mapping. Uh, it's very important because the kids, a lot, a lot of schools really think that agriculture is just cows and vegetables and things like that. We have the drones to come and actually teach them something about agriculture engineering. GIS is a part of agriculture engineering so um, we like to tie them 
to agriculture through technology, if that makes any sense. Well, you know, middle school is such an important time to give students something that they can, you know, look forward to in high school and, uh, and a career. So that's really why it's so special to be at a middle school is giving them that opportunity to just be exposed to this type of technology. To see more highlights from 4-H week in Louisiana, head over to our website at twilighttv.org. While crawfish season is still a ways off, farmers are getting their fields ready now. When the weather cools, farmers will begin to flood fields, which encourages crawfish to emerge from their burrows. Craig Gotro brings us a crawfish season preview from Vermilion Parish. In a few weeks, farmers will begin flooding these former rice fields and transform them into next season's crawfish ponds. Getting a field ready for crawfish starts early, in the spring, when choosing the variety of rice to grow in it. We grow varieties in the crawfish ponds that are uh, gonna, gonna be maybe a little taller, a little leafier, uh, bigger stems, um, you know, whatever it takes to get as much food out in that field as possible. Richard likes to recycle water from ponds located nearby. According to him, it makes sense both economically and environmentally. We're not drawing down off the aquifers. Uh, it's cheap water, because you're not relifting it real high. Doesn't cost us a whole lot of diesel or electricity. Uh, whatever the whatever the fuel source is. While some farmers may be getting eager to flood their fields, conditions are not favorable, so they should hold off flooding until the weather cools. If you flood this field, it's going to be some really bad habitat for crawfish. There's just too much uh, dead organic matter on the ground. That's going to rot, decompose, and you have uh, really low oxygen. Monsoon-type rains are typical in South Louisiana, especially during hurricane season. But while this may be free water, farmers should remove it quickly to keep crawfish from emerging in poor conditions. Maybe best just to hold a little shallow flood, just a, a few inches, just to wet the vegetation, but do not hold a real deep flood. Uh, let all that excess water get out. Last year's season was below average. This year conditions have been more favorable, and farmers are optimistic about having a better harvest. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gocho reporting. Some farmers will begin harvesting their ponds as early as November to take advantage of higher prices for their catch. Coming up after the break, Jennifer Finley takes us on a culinary adventure to the New Orleans Fish House with Chef Tori McPhail. You don't want to miss a single bite. Stay with us. I know I hope they're biting today. I hope they are. Find your place in the country and the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Before you sweeten your morning joe, before the icing on the cake, Before the sugar hits the shelf, it begins with a family of sugarcane farmers dedicated to growing Louisiana for more than 220 years. The Sugarcane Growers of Louisiana, making life sweeter naturally. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane. I'm a farmer. I am a farm wife. I am a cowboy. I am a grass farmer. I'm a businesswoman. I'm a conservationist. I am an advocate. I am a voice for Louisiana farmers. I'm always learning. I'm a husband. I'm a mom. I am a dad. I'm a granddad. I am a consumer. I grow the food that feeds your family, and I'm proud of it. I am Farm Bureau. 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 We are Farm Bureau. where we profile Louisiana's local ingredients. Today, we're at the New Orleans Fish House. We're gonna meet up with my good friend, executive chef Tori McPhail of Commander's Palace. 
We're gonna shop the market, then head back to his house and make a delicious seafood gumbo. So come join us. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. By the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. Okay, this is a room that we do our processing in. As you look around, you'll see tables, and uh, during certain portions of the day, we have cutters that will come. They will look at this board and get orders from all of our fine restaurants in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, along the Gulf Coast, and then each cutter will take ownership of an order. Well, my biggest question first off is, where is all this product coming from? Well, we buy product from all around the United States, uh, but we try to buy as much Gulf product as possible. So we have drum uh, that's on the table back over here. We have tuna that comes directly from the Gulf of Mexico that's in here. Got some sheep heads, some snappers, some triple tail. Uh, we try to support as much of our local fishermen as we can. And so this is a big facility. How much product really runs through here annually? When sheep heads run in, we go through about 25 to 30,000 pounds of sheep head a week drum because it's more available consistently throughout the year we'll go through about 30 to 50,000 pounds of drum wow. in a week and then in redfish uh, depending on what we're able to harvest from the farm that'll be from 10,000 to 20,000 pounds a week okay we have some small black drum uh, we call them puppy drum because they're smaller uh, this is the preferred size fish uh, for commanders for the restaurants Drum is what we call utility fish. It is so good that we can do anything else we want, we want with it. It can be crab meat, fresh shrimp, saute a fresh crawfish, we flambe that with cognac, that can go on top of it. It's really, it's a the fish of all, all recipes. Very versatile. Anything. Is it uh, what people say is white and flaky fish? Yeah, so the, the New Orleanians palate, especially the Brennan family that have been here for generations, they like something that's white, light, flaky, and very delicate in flavor. And this is absolutely perfect for a New Orleans palate. And this is, this is my favorite too, I think. Um, nothing better than a redfish cubion, in my opinion. Love it. That is really good. So we get these fish farmed and we get some wild. Okay. There is no wild season in the state of Louisiana. We're hoping that eventually we can persuade the government to allow it to be able to be commercially harvested again. I'm, I'm always impressed on how when, when they hit your line, how much muscle they have and how like, it's a very aggressive fish, and so people sport fish for them quite often, and they're actually not just now bass tournaments. There are redfish tournaments along the coast of Louisiana where people come from all over the United States and the world to turn with fish for these fish. Well, I think that sounds like the perfect next field to feast. What do you think? I, I think we need to plan it. We'll grab our buddy, and we'll go out and do some fishing together. How's that sound? I'm <laughs> here. My favorite, though, was when I went bow fishing for redfish. Yes. Fun. Yeah. Just yeah. F-U-N fun. Yes. Now over here we have some tuna. Uh -huh. This is Gulf product as well. You could sear off a piece of that right now and give that to me and I could eat it. Yes. And well, you know what? With a spoon. I, I will do that about once a week. I'll tell you what, the guys down at home, they've been doing an amazing job taking care of the product and it is extremely impressive. I literally here in the States I've never seen anything like it. That the care and passion that they take taking care of their products is exactly the same as chefs do in our kitchens. We're taking stuff home with us today, by the way, because want. we're going to be making a fresh, delicious seafood gumbo. I heard that you have some soft shell crabs in the other room. Yes, we do. Those Amazing. are my absolute favorite. Mine as well. I love this. Wait, can we do that again? And take two. Action. Your <laughs> stage debut. The debut. Dun, oh. dun, 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 Our favorite here, some beautiful, fresh soft shell crabs that we uh, just got in. Cliff. This little guy right here is making a few oh. bubbles for you. He's trying to impress you this morning. Beautiful, yes. gorgeous, gorgeous. Every hour to hour and a half, there's somebody checking those tanks. When that crab comes out, they'll wait a few minutes so that it gets a little bit harder so it doesn't just fall apart. And then they'll remove those crabs one at a time 
throughout a 24 hour process in order to provide the product for us like this that I can give the chef. We have the hard shell crab as well, which can be used for boiling for around the home, or we have it picked for meat to supply to chef so they can use the jumbo lump yeah. to topping things, claws for stuffing. Well, this is so exciting to be able to have a day like this. And next up, Tori's gonna take us to his house. I'm so excited and make us a big seafood gumbo with all of these local wonderful ingredients. So y'all come join us. Louisiana oysters, salty, sweet, and delicious. But have you ever thought about what happens to all those oyster shells? Most of them end up in trash cans and landfills. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is changing this with its oyster shell recycling program. And you can help by visiting these participating restaurants. It's a simple and delicious way to restore our coast. The shells will then be used to sustain and rebuild oyster reefs. Remember, once you shuck them, don't just chuck them. This is the moment I knew his future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Landowners are minding the Louisiana forest for our grandchildren. A place for wildlife. Recreation. Lumber for homes. It's the right thing to do. Forestry, covering half our state, all of our hearts. I am a giant panda bear, love you, man, boo. I almost went extinct, but I'm not because of you. I am a grass, and I almost was huge. It wasn't for the help of the San Diego Zoo. How about you join us? Save it as your tortoise. We need your help to bring species back, so bring us back from the brink of extinction. We are here in Chef Tori's house, lucky us, and we are about to make an incredible seafood gumbo. So show me what all we brought back. So we have a beautiful spread here, and our dear friend Cliff at New Orleans Fish House put this up with all kinds of great seafood which we saw this morning. Uh, so one of the things I love is, is fresh blue crabs. So these have been cleaned. We use that kind of, it'll go in early to kind of make a stock as, as our gumbo is going. And we'll add this stuff a little bit later. This has already been detailed, uh, but this is um, Louisiana wild white shrimp. Beautiful. Okay, this is fresh drum and fresh redfish, which we saw earlier. Mm -hmm. Fresh jumbo lump crab. It comes right out of the, the heart, kind of right in the middle of these crabs here. And also some fresh, beautiful, briny oysters. And a treat, uh, we have um, Gulf of Mexico royal red shrimp. So these are deep water shrimp that a lot of the finer restaurants are serving. Here, I'll tell you about our growing season is so long. Today we have in um, fresh red and yellow tomatoes right out of the garden. But instead of just green, we have red and yellow bell peppers. These are all Orange. Louisiana. All locally grown right here in Louisiana. But it just provides a little bit more color for your gumbo. Typically it's about one to one ratio, okay? Fat to oil. So okay. what we're gonna do is use half the amount of fat so it's a lot more healthy for you. So the first step is we're gonna make a roux. That's exactly right. This is a cup of flour. The whole thing. Whole thing. So you just want to kind of keep working this around, working this around. Yeah, isn't it part of it that you're never, when you're making a roux like this, I mean, it's just a constant activity, it's a constant stir. Yeah, that's that's it. So you just want to make sure at this point your, your pot is already hot, right? Your oil and the flour is already room temperature. So there's no time for a wine break? Well, I was just going to say, make sure your glass of wine is full <laughs> before you start your roux. Tori's thinking great. about hiring me as his new sous chef. Are you kidding me? Yeah, you're great. Well, as many years as you and I have spent together in the kitchen, right? <laughs> You know better than to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and once it starts to smoke like that, you're doing really, really good. So we're gonna go maybe 10 more seconds and you're good. One, two, seven Louisiana, eight Louisiana, nine Louisiana. Doing great. 10. Perfect. So at this point, we're gonna add these ingredients. And these are just uh, white onions and fresh celery. Tori, thanks for bringing us to your home it's today. Nice, huh? It's only 12 blocks away from Commander, so it's great. I can just walk to work every day. 
enjoy the neighborhood. But at this point, we're gonna add our, our peppers. We're gonna add just a bit of garlic. So we've got some stock next, okay? This is seafood stock. We're gonna add our fresh blue crabs. It's starting to steam, which is fantastic. Once it comes to a simmer, we're gonna turn the heat down. And about every five minutes or so, we're just gonna gently uh, skim the top. This is what you call a Louisiana gumbo facial. I'm just gonna finish this with uh, more fresh seafood. Look at all this delicious Louisiana seafood. That's gorgeous, it's nice and thick, nice oh. and chunky. And the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add all these ingredients too. This is chopped parsley, green onions, okay? Organic fresh red and yellow tomatoes. Into this, we're just gonna try to re reheat our fresh jumbo lump crab. First, we have some delicious Louisiana rice. Well, I am so excited to dig into lunch. This is the most delicious looking seafood gumbo. So we are about to dig in and we will see you next time on Field to Feast. Thanks for joining us. Cheers, friend. Cheers. Mmm. It's not too bad for somebody that's kind of whipped together on Wednesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Is it? <laughs> it is Tuesday. <laughs> Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. By the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, beef, it's what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, think rice. As we mentioned earlier in the show, this week is National 4-H Week, and we're celebrating with a special 4-H-themed Twyla Boost. 4-H reaches almost 6 million young people and empowers them with the skills to become lifetime leaders. The organization educates students about agriculture, health, science, technology, and the importance of civic engagement and community service. September was Hunger Awareness Month, and 4-H groups from across the country set out to raise awareness and work to feed other young people and families facing hunger in their communities. What I focus is, is I focus on healthy living. Since I made healthy living a lifestyle of mine, I like to share it with all the youth that I teach. And that's sort of where I found my passion. But I was more interested in helping others as well because they taught me so much and I wanted to give back as well. I've actually always been interested in helping people uh, with this particularly. I've done volunteer work with 4-H and other organizations throughout my entire life. And so uh, when I was a kid, I had problems with that myself. And so I wanted to just go back forward and it's always great to see young people doing great things that does it for this edition of twyla be sure to join us next week when we'll show you how the natural resources conservation service is working with ducks unlimited and rice farmers to help migratory birds until then you can watch all of our stories online at twilatv.org and be sure to like us on facebook follow us on twitter and instagram and oh subscribe to our youtube channel and turn on those notifications so you don't miss a single story and some special content you won't want to miss. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.